Hello. Unity of East Louisville. Nice to be back. So what, what did you do this week? What did you do to spread joy and the principles of unity? What did you do to make someone realize that within them they have the spark of divinity? Huh? I don't know. I'll have to check up on you guys. Good job. Yes. We have one person. Thank God. <laughs> Thank you, God. <laughs> okay, so I came up with this talk title today because this is what happens when people ask me for talk titles, uh, which is Eden or Gethsemane. Now, those of you that are familiar with these stories know that they're both what? Gardens. Gardens, correct. So gardens represent to us exactly what it sounds like, growth, life, spiritual possibility, cultivation, thought, belief. So in the first garden story, um, God had just made Adam the first man. And if you know the story, he made the garden after he made the man. So I always thought that was a little weird because the guys like must have sat around in the desert or wherever until the garden was finished. But So he made the garden. God made the garden. And God was really chatty. I don't know if you knew that in the Old Testament. God talked a lot. And the difference between the gardens, too, is that God didn't stop talking out loud in the second garden, really. Um, this was often a thought I had when I was um, an annoying student in Catholic school with my nuns, is that I would ask things like, how come God didn't talk when Jesus was around? You know, he had a really big mouth before. And then Jesus gets here, and you think that he'd help a guy out, right? <laughs> that he'd have something to say, or, you know, that when times got tough, he'd boom his voice out. And I understand that this was his, his to do, etc. but, you know, just a small word here or there would have been nice. So in Eden, we had Adam and Eve. And we understand this as an allegory or a, a story for us to learn by. We understand that. That this didn't really happen. That there really wasn't an Adam and Eve. And we really all didn't come from Adam and Eve, from these two people. But anyway, um, if you do believe that, uh, see me after. <laughs> because we'll talk. We'll talk. Um, so Adam and Eve were in the garden. Masculine consciousness, feminine consciousness, um, and, uh, and, you know, they're told not, there's a couple trees, there's this is a tree of uh, life, and the tree of good and evil, tree of knowledge, and God tells them, here are all these things, this beautiful garden for you, except don't, you cannot, absolutely cannot eat of these two trees, which I think is really mean, I really do, I mean, you know, it's kind of setting you up, it's like having a kid in putting like this giant plate of brownies like on the table. And it's like, you can eat these bananas and these apples, but you cannot eat these brownies under any circumstances. And if you do, I will throw you out of this house forever. 
good parenting. <laughs> so obviously, you know the story. Um, and then I want to clear up one thing, because they try to, like a man clearly made this story up, because they try to blame Eve. However, Adam was also present. Let me make that clear. When the serpent came and tempted them both into eating of the apple from the tree of knowledge or the tree of good and evil. And it was just Eve that took action and said, hey, what do you think about this apple? And, you know, she didn't shove the apple down Adam's throat. Um, she said, do you want some of the apple? And he said yes, and they both ate the apple. And um, so they were tempted. They had their temptation. And then, and then God came, it says, God came walking <laughs> into the shady part of the garden. So, I, you know, I guess God was there. And Adam and Eve went and hid behind a bush because they were ashamed, because they had eaten of the tree of good and evil. And so suddenly they knew all these things about shame and really no longer had these, this perfect God consciousness. They were now human, right? They were human. They knew human things. They knew about shame. They knew about all these things. They got fig leaves and covered themselves up. And God said, look at what you've done. Now you've eaten of this tree. I told you not to. If you wouldn't have eaten it, you never would have known any of these things. And now you know about it. And you, know, and you shouldn't have listened to that serpent that came. And it's a good thing you didn't eat that tree of eternal life because if you've done that, then you'd live forever with this knowledge of good and evil. And that would have been like the worst case scenario, like the perfect storm, and I can't imagine how bad that would be. So he throws Adam and Eve out of the garden, and he sends them east of Eden. Um, and of course, you know, then we're all cursed because of that. Um, now, the garden at Gethsemane is where Jesus, who was this ooh, radical teacher, and I want you to really get what Jesus was doing. Because he wasn't wandering around, you know, like a hippie. You know, he wasn't really wandering around like love man, peace man, you know. Let's make flower necklaces and sit around and sing Kumbaya. That's not really what was happening. He was bucking the system as it existed. And in the wild, weird, and wonderful history of New Thought this afternoon, I'm going to share with you um, a Divinity School address from Emerson that is a perfect example of someone who is bucking the system. Um, just briefly, to give you a real life example, Emerson was uh, a Unitarian minister. I know we get confused with them. Um, a Unitarian minister who had gone to Harvard Divinity School, and he uh, had a church. And in the church that he had, he had a problem with communion. He didn't really believe in communion, and so he told his church, I'm not really going to do the communion thing. And the church sort of said, okay, we're going to try to get on board with that. And they really couldn't get on board with the I don't believe in communion thing. And so Emerson left the church, who was a minister. Um, and when he left the church, he said something that is uh, one of ministers favorite tongue-in-cheek lines, which is that the best thing I can do for the ministry is leave it. <laughs> it's funny for us. All right. Um, but at any rate, so Harvard Divinity School had some students, and they were graduating. And they invited the rebel to come and talk to them at Harvard Divinity School. And what he said, oh, my God, it's so great. I can't wait to share it with you. I'm not going to tell you. Um, but anyway, it's so great. But 
to go back to Jesus, Jesus basically did these same things. He walked around and said these things that were so, like, revolutionary, you know, so off the wall. He's like, you know, he was a Jew that is saying, forget all these laws and rules and the 660, whatever it is, um, rules and the Old Testament, all that stuff, and this is really simple, and this is what you got to do. And all of that culminated into, obviously, the authorities coming after him and his caravan because they were bringing bad things into the country. So, uh, so Jesus knew that this, this death penalty that he was being assessed was imminent. And so he went to the garden um, and, and keep in mind that this is a guy with super-duper Christ consciousness. This is like the perfect student of unity. Like he lives what he believes, and he, he uses the law of mind action to like actually produce things instantly because he's got it. Like he's so got this teaching. So he goes to the garden, and he invites some of his friends, his disciples, to come with him. And he goes there, and um, so he's in pain because he knows he's going to be crucified, uh, sentenced to death. And he tells his friends, he's like, all right, I'm going to go over here and pray. I need you guys to stay awake for me. Don't fall asleep. I need you to keep the high watch, basically. I need you to, to you know... I mean, in so many words, I need you to make sure that I don't fall asleep during this time. So they're there, and they're like, oh, no, Jesus, we won't fall asleep. We promise we won't fall asleep. Absolutely not, because we know how hard this is for you, and we would never fall asleep in this time of need. So Jesus goes over and prays, and Jesus is having a divine and human moment at this time, and he's saying, God, I don't know if I can go through with this. Can you take this burden from me? Can I pass this cup to you? For God's sakes, can you say something? Because you haven't said anything the whole time. You know, all these things he's thinking to himself. And, and uh, he ends that with, or if it's your will, then don't. Then I'll go through with it. And he goes through this cycle three times in the garden. Meanwhile, back at the disciples, they're falling asleep. And Jesus is going through all this, and he's turning around, and he's seeing the disciples are asleep, and he's like, yo, disciples, wake up. Wake up. I asked you to do one thing, and that was to stay awake when I was going through all this in my time of tumult and trouble, and you fell asleep, and they're like, oh, Jesus, we're so sorry. You know, we fell asleep. We promised not to fall asleep again. And they did again. He woke them up again. They did again. He woke them up again. Now, there's an interesting parallel between all of this. The parallel is sleep, you know, because Adam also fell asleep in the garden. The disciples fell asleep. The sleep also seems to coincide with Jesus' doubts about being the super-duper divine message-bringer and what he has to face humanly. And this loss of faith, this loss of consciousness, this state of sleep, this state of, of lack of awareness, this place of doubt, this connection to the world of a Effect is what is really getting under his skin. So I was driving down here today, and I was, I didn't play any music on the way down. Sometimes I just like to think, and um, which is why I got here at 10 of, because I was thinking and I missed a couple exits and <laughs> missed Dover Road or whatever that road is. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, I was passing this truck because I had, you know, my speed, whatever, uh, cruise control set at 75, which is five miles over the speed limit. I figured that's plenty, 
you know, they say, five, you're fine, ten, you're mine. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm going to use my five miles an hour to go over the speed limit. And this white SUV, and I'm passing this truck. So the truck is, is going, I swear, 75 too. So I'm not passing him quickly. This white car from Connecticut comes up behind me, and mind you, I have my Kentucky tags on, so I'm like, whatever, Connecticut. Anyway, is behind me, and it's like right, you know how people do that? They get right, ooh, like right up against you. You know, like I don't get it when you're two car lengths behind me, or three like you're supposed to be. I still see you. This isn't going to convince me anymore. It's not going to startle me into action. It's just going to really annoy me. So um, anyway, I saw this, and I tapped my brakes you know, quickly just to be like, you know, cool it. I will pass. I just would like, if anything happens between now and the time I get in front of this truck, if I have to slam on my brakes for any reason at all, that we both don't have a huge accident because you have to send a message to me by getting right up my butt, basically. So, um, so the guy did not get the message and still decided to, to press on with the pressure and get right up my butt regardless. And why did I tell that story? <laughs> there was a reason and then I, wait. Wait, they call this a payoff <laughs> when you're speaking. Yeah, so, oh, consciousness, thank you, sleeping. Yes, that was it, thank you. When you do talks, they call this a payoff. So when you, when you start a story, the payoff is when you, when you have something to say that pays off the reason you told the story. And when people don't pay something off in a talk, you're like, what the heck was that about? So I just caught myself there. All right. So anyway, deeply lost in contemplation. And I was in this happy place and suddenly ripped out of it by the effectual world and this guy and this truck and trying to be safe. And I thought I was being courteous and the whole thing. And then I noticed he didn't use his turn signal either, which really annoys me. But anyway, um, so uh, it, it was such a clear example of me getting like ripped out of a good place and put right back in the bad place because I uh, was engaged in reality in the world of effect and I was no longer being causal at all. Now, Jesus and Adam and Eve all got ripped right out of that world of cause by the effectual world and the things that were happening to them, and they struggled with it. I mean, I think Adam and Eve tried to plead their case about the apple, you know, that it was there, and what do you expect of us? The brownies were on the table. I don't know what to do. We ate the brownies, and, you know, we're cast out, and, and Jesus is like, you know what? I did all this stuff, and now I'm in doubt, and my friends and my supporters that are supposed to be here for me are falling asleep. And, uh, but I'm going to do this, and when we treat this metaphysically, all of this, the sleep, the resurrection, the struggle, all of this is about our crisis of consciousness, capital C. Our crisis between what we know we are and what we feel like we are in that moment. So when that guy, I came out of my big C conscious thought, and the guy was that white, whatever, SUV was right up my butt, puts me right in small C consciousness, and all that's out the window, which is what happens, and it's hard. It's hard to live this life. It's hard to be a student of unity all the time, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. 
It is. Did you notice I used the word caravan? Did anyone catch that? Yeah. Okay. So it is hard for me because I watch the news and I'm very involved and I see these things and I just think, oh, you know, um, I just don't know if I can take it. But in both cases, there is a mechanism at work, which in Latin um, is called Felix culpa, which means, can we know what culpa means? Any Catholics? Sorry. Mia culpa, mia culpa, mia maxima culpa. Yes. And Felix is happy. Right. Like happy sorrow. The happy fall. This is what is what exactly or what is our expectation or what in hindsight, and this is what it is for most people, is when they have a period of their life, the dark night of the soul. Are there any Joseph Campbell fans? Okay, right. So Hero of a Thousand Faces, The Hero's Journey. If you're not, you should be. He's amazing. Um, so The Hero's Journey is uh, basically a part of every story. Jesus' story, Adam and Eve's story, your story, my story. Where, and this, this church's story, where we... Uh, we have a call to adventure. We accept the call to adventure. And it, I use the term adventure, which just means like a challenge, right? Because <clears throat> you know it's not going to be easy. There's something in front of you that's not going to be easy, but you're accepting the call to adventure, and you do. And part of this hero's journey is that a supernatural aid comes to you somehow. So think, uh, think Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, Hero's Journey, perfect example. Dorothy accepts the call to adventure. She ends up in Oz or with the munchkins. And uh, she receives supernatural aid through the slippers and Glinda and all her friends, her disciples who coincidentally fall asleep, right, along with her in the poppy field. I just want you to see the parallels here. All right, so this call to adventure, the hero's journey, and so you then are confronted with this thing that you're supposed to overcome, and you overcome it, and you die to it in some way, in some form, consciously, spiritually, physically, only to overcome it and be something new. This butterfly, perfect example. Okay, so the hero's journey. All on the hero's journey. We're all on the hero's journey. And going back to this idea of Felix Culpa. So the happy fall. All a happy fall. This is a quote from Milton from Paradise Lost. O oh, goodness infinite, goodness immense, that all this good of evil shall produce. And evil turned to good more wonderful than that which creation first brought forth light out of darkness. Now, this is why I have to do these talks, and I have to be a minister, or I have to be listening to somebody else telling me this, because when I am in this place where I am miserable, and I'm looking around at my world, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. This is just terrible. I can't take another day. I really can't take any more of it. I think to myself, Felix Kalpa. Felix Culpa, the hero's journey, that person's journey, those people's journey, my journey, our journey. What is ours to do 
in this place? What is ours to do in this place where we're in the middle of our hero's journey, where we're in the middle of our Felix Culpa, when we're in the middle of our apotheosis, which is the process of becoming divine. And this cycle happens many times in our lives, sometimes more greatly, sometimes more small. But it nonetheless happens. So I want to share this part of a poem. It's called The Brave and Startling Truth by Maya Angelou. And the reason I'm sharing this today is because I was you know, doing sermon and class research yesterday, and this one website I was on had this little pop-up window, and it says, how would you like a poem today? And I thought, well, okay, I will, sure. And this poem popped up, and I'm like, this is great. This is a great poem. Okay. So listen to this. This is only a part of it. Out of such chaos, of such contradiction, we learn that we are neither devils nor divines. Hold that thought. When we come to it, we, this people, on this wayward floating body, created on this earth, of this earth, have the power to fashion for this earth a climate where every man and every woman can live freely without sanctimonious piety, without crippling fear when we come to it. We must confess that we are the possible. We are the miraculous. The true wonder of this world, that is when and only when we come to it. So the message is we come to it. We come to it. We are it. We act on it. Our job is not just to show up here on Sunday, sing a bunch of happy songs, and hug each other, although I love, I love all of that. I do. Our job, and it's why I asked you at the beginning, what did you do this week? Now, it doesn't mean you have to run around and say, oh, let me teach you about five unity, basic unity principles. Let me teach you about this and that. That's not the job you're doing. The job that you're doing is living and being and speaking and acting as a student of unity. You are called to action. Now, I know it's easier to be a student of unity and show up on Sunday and celebrate and go home and have the guy pull up behind you and force you to go faster without a question or with anger or with disdain and without a blessing. Because believe me, I had to work on the blessing. Jesus had to work on the blessing. Adam and Eve had to work on the blessing. We all have to work on the, uh, on the happy fall, the happy sorrow. We have to work to see the blessing in the middle of the storm. And if we can't see it, we have to know it because we know the truth, and that's what makes us come to this church and have this belief and share this joy and share this knowledge of the goodness of God. It is our job to be the light in the darkness. And so I come this week of Thanksgiving with this table, as I spoke about meditation, that's set before you with all of this beauty and grandeur, with all of these spiritual gifts. These are your gifts to give. This is Thanksgiving, not thanks-taking. It's Thanksgiving 
It's a time to give. It's a time to share. It's a time to be. It's a time to love. It's a time to shine. It's a time to be joyful. It's a time to smile. It's a time to be tolerant. It's a time to act. Act like the love that you are. Act like the God that you are. Act like the divine thing that you have received into your heart. Act like love. Live love on purpose today and every day. This is our job. And thank God it's our job. What a wonderful job. Thank you and bless you.